I want to say something about our 0 0.2 release. So we're going to begin working on our second project uh, this week. And I'm going to do with you what I've done with a couple of different groups of students in the course in the past, and that is I'm going to have you get involved in Hacktoberfest. So Hacktoberfest is a, it's a yearly, um, I don't know what the right word is, program, festival, uh, opportunity to get involved in open source. So it's put on uh, this year by DigitalOcean, Intel, um, DevTO, and it's a, essentially what it's trying to do is it's trying to get people like yourself involved in contributing to open source. So what you do is you sign up for Hacktoberfest and you complete a series of pull requests during the month of October. And if you manage to do that, then they send you a shirt and some stickers, etc. cetera. And um, it's a lot of fun. So it's, it's kind of nice for us because we're at the point in our course where I want you to start contributing to open source projects. And this gives us sort of an excuse to join into a larger global effort to get people all over the world involved. So every year, tons and tons and tons of people get involved in working on um, open source as a result of Hacktoberfest. So you won't be alone. You're not going to be the only people who are out there starting and who are, are working on this. So I want to address a number of things in this video. I want to talk about how to find things to work on, some things to avoid, some strategies for getting started. Uh, I want to give you some historical analysis of what I've seen in the past and um, just get you set up to begin doing this. Now, one of the first things that I know I'm going to hear from people is, I've never done this before. Uh, I'm not good enough to do this. I don't know how to do it. I feel intimidated. I don't know where to start, etc. All of these things. So despite what this small voice in the back of your head is saying to you, I want you to listen to me and I'm going to tell you that you can do this. So I have seen your colleagues for years and years do this. And they all tell me the same thing at the beginning. I don't know how to do this. I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. And I feel intimidated and, you know, I'm uncomfortable. So what I want you to do is I want you to go out there and I want you to try working on real software. So take all the skills that you have, all those classes that you've taken, learning programming languages and learning frameworks and learning how to do things. And I want you to apply it. I want you to start building up some real experience working on open source projects. So I, for the last couple of years, I've written uh, blog posts at the end of each Hacktoberfest, and I'll post links to them in this week's if, uh, materials if you want. And so it, it gives me some insight into what, what kinds of things can happen. I just wanted to share a few things with you. So in the last two years, uh, the students that have taken this course have done over 500 pull requests to open source projects, hundreds of open source projects. And I thought I would just you know, show you a couple of things that I noticed when I looked at these. So this was from 2018. Here's some examples of the kinds of projects that people worked on during Hacktoberfest. So people did everything from working on Visual Studio Code to working on blogging software. They worked on things like Pandas and Keras, which are um, data machine learning and data uh, platforms they worked on. Lots of projects with Mozilla and Microsoft, and they worked on Brave. Uh, they worked on Angular, uh, all kinds of things. And every year that I do this, this list looks very, very different. They also worked on lots of little tiny projects that you've never heard of, and they only have a couple of developers. And so it's big things and it's small things. It's things that have a huge impact and ship all over the world. And it's things that are being used. Lots of people have contributed to you know, um, hospital software or like just all kinds of things. I can't even go into the list of all the things that I have seen when I've looked at this. So last year, I asked my students after they finished to write blog posts and talk about um, what the experience was like. And I also asked them to answer a few questions. So I thought I would just talk about what they said so you can think about this as you get started. So I said to them, you know, what are you proud of? What did you do during the month of October that you thought was really neat? 
people did things like they contributed to big projects. So a lot of people come into the course and they say, I really want to contribute to something important. I want to contribute to NASA. So I've had students contribute code to NASA. I want, I had students last time contribute to the Microsoft uh, standard template library for C++, or people got involved in the Rust project. They um, were really proud of working on small projects, but projects that needed their help. So lots of times people find projects where um, getting involved and adding their code really makes a huge difference. People learn new languages. Uh, people were really excited to get their project code merged into things and see it ship. A lot of people used their ability with um, other languages and they did translation work. I'll come back and talk about this before, but being able to use a skill that you have and help, uh, help work with other people, seeing things ship, learning new technologies, getting involved in open source communities. This is a big one. So it's one thing to know that there's people out there that are doing cool things. It's another thing to be part of it. So I want you to feel empowered to go out there and become part of these communities to get involved and do this kind of work. And this is a big one here that a lot of people talked about the fact that they were able to overcome the intimidation of getting started and the intimidation of just getting involved. So I know that's where a lot of you are beginning in this. And so I want you to know that you're not alone. What surprised you about working in open source? People were much nicer than I expected. What you're not going to find when you start working on open source, nobody is going to yell at you. Nobody's going to tell you to get lost. Nobody's going to say, why are you here? Like, this doesn't make any sense that you're sending me code. Imagine if I work on a project and somebody sends me their code, they fix a bug. You're going to be happy to, you're going to ha be happy to get uh, that, that, you know, that contribution. Um, people were surprised at how little documentation there was. And I just, I mean, I turn around to the students and I say, how well do you document your code? Uh, do you write extensive comments? Do you write documentation? And a lot of people, you know, just kind of cover their eyes and uh, open source is no different. So programmers like to write code, not documentation. So you may find there aren't a lot of docs for things that you're doing. People were surprised that you could work on stuff with big companies. You can work with Facebook, you can work with Netflix, but you can also work with really small little projects that have only a few volunteers. There's every range of things you can imagine. People were surprised to see that random people out on the internet commented on their code. So you would submit something and all kinds of people would, would show up and try and help you make it better or they would get involved in commenting on it. Some people were surprised that, that the responses were faster. Some people found that the responses were slower. Um, people were surprised to learn that everything I use has some amount of open source in it. This is a really big one. So when you're thinking about how to get involved in open source, I'm going to challenge you to take a look at the software that you use on a daily basis and then go and look and see what is open source in what you use. You'll be surprised at how much you can contribute to that you didn't realize was open source. Lots of open source isn't products, it's technology. It's things that they make products out of. So many cool projects I didn't know about. Um, people were amazed, for example, that even on small issues, how many of the main contributors to the project got involved. So for example, there was one student who did um, a fix in the Node.js project and got seven different reviewers commenting on their code. Even just a small little change attracts a lot of attention. Um, a lot of people found that the Hacktoberfest label was not that helpful. I'm gonna talk about this when we look at how to find issues when you're looking in GitHub. Get a good first issue doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. So that's a big one, we'll talk about this. Um, lots of projects have different standards, so you have to be aware of the project you're working on. Everybody does things differently. Um, surprised to see some of the hacks even really big projects use. So this is one of the great things about going out and working on open source is you're going to go and see what people actually do when they ship software, and you'll be surprised. Sometimes they use elegant, beautifully architected systems and sometimes they just slap together a bunch of scripts and they just make it work and they ship it and people are using all kinds of things that are made out of you know twine and <laughs> like things that you can't believe they work and yet they do the whole internet is built up out of all these little um, weird projects surprised at how willing people were to let us get involved in their projects this one is huge you're going to find that people will be excited to have you join them, people will want you to be there, and you can get involved in all sorts of these things. And that there's lots of camaraderie between devs in the community. There's a real network of people who wanna see you do great things. Okay, 
the last thing I asked them was, what advice would you give? So the first piece of advice is critical. Start small and progress from there. There's going to be a temptation when you get going on this that you're going to have some unrealistic standard for yourself. You go from saying, I don't think I could do this to saying, OK, I'll try it, but I'm going to try like working on some big, huge, complicated thing inside React or something like that. I want you to I want you to be careful. Begin with something small and work your way up. So we're going to work and progress, uh, work on progress and progressing through this as we go. Manage your time well. It takes way longer than you think. This, this is so, so, so important. Every single thing that you look at and you say, you know what, this will probably take me uh, a day to work on. I want you to multiply that by four. Anything that you think is going to take a day is going to take you four days. And then you're going to have to wait for people to get back to you. So now it's going to take seven days, etc. So you're going to be amazed that um, everything takes longer. It takes longer to set things up. It takes longer to de debug things. It takes longer to get uh, an answer back from somebody. So everything takes longer than you think. You need to learn how to use GitHub's advanced search really well. I'm going to show you how to do that today. You need to make use of your peers. You need to ask for help. If you try and do this by yourself on your own, you're going to fail. There's no way you can do all of this by yourself. You're going to need to talk to people. You're going to need to get advice. You're going to need to get reviews. You're going to get to need, need pointers. You can ask me. You can ask the people in the class on Slack. And you can ask people on GitHub and in the open source community. Uh, people give the advice that you should spend less time looking for a perfect issue and more time fixing what they call a good enough issue. So when you're out there looking for things to do on GitHub, don't spend four days scrolling through all these issues and say, no, 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 no. Just fix one of them. Go and fix it. What we're really trying to do in October is we're trying to give you experience fixing issues, fixing code in open source projects. This doesn't have to be the thing you're going to make your career out of. You could fix a, a bug in a, in a piece of software and then never do anything else in that project ever again. But it's just a piece of experience. I've talked about this. Don't be afraid to fail. Even if your pull request doesn't work, you're going to learn a lot. That's really important. Pick issues in projects that you're interested in since it takes so much time. This is a big one. So if you know you love Java and you love working on testing and you love those sorts of things, look for projects that do that. If you hate that, don't do it. If you hate databases, don't work on a database project. Um, if you know you love a language, work on that language, etc. Don't be afraid to work on things you don't know. You can learn a lot more than you think. So there's an interesting one. You may not know a language. Maybe you don't know Python, but you really want to learn it. So should you avoid working on Python projects? No, you can go and work on them, but you're going to have to be aware that everything's going to take longer than you thought, especially when you're learning it, and you can learn as you go. Read the contributing documentation and save yourself time and mistakes. We'll talk about this later. How do I know how to get involved in a project? How do I look for signs of you know, how I'm supposed to do things? Run and test the code locally before you send it to GitHub. That's a big one. Don't be too picky with what you work on. Just get involved. Similar idea. And look at previously closed PRs in a project to get ideas on how to solve them. OK, so these are all really great pieces of advice that I would encourage you to remember. And I would just add a few more. You don't need permission to start working on something in open source. This isn't a job interview. You don't have to go and talk to the manager and say, I'm a Seneca student and I was hoping, here's my resume and I'd like to get involved. You can just get involved. If you know how to write the code, you can go and do it. You don't need any permission. However, there's another side to this. No one is going to phone you up in the middle of the day and say, hey, I heard you're doing Hacktoberfest. Come and work on my project. You have to go and do this yourself. You're going to have to step out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to go and volunteer to do something in an open source project. You have to make it happen. OK, so what I wanted to talk about is how to find projects that um, that you could work on. OK, so let's take a look at a few things. So I pulled up the GitHub trending uh, page and you can see on github.com slash trending, you can see the uh, projects that people are st giving stars to. So whenever you click on the star on a project, it shows up here. And there's lots of different um, projects. We can, for example, we can filter this by language. So if all you wanted was JavaScript projects, you could say, show me the JavaScript projects. Or right now, I'm seeing any project. 
You can filter it by language. So if you want only projects that are in English, you can do that. But if you, if you speak another language and you wanted to see projects that are in Russian or something else, you could type that in here and you could try and find people that are working in those languages. You can also look for the projects that are trending today, this week, or this month. And I know that you've looked at this list before, but let me talk about, should you work on popular software? Okay, so things that are trending, are these good things to work on? Let's take the very top one here. So this is GitHub's command line tool, CLI tool. So when I go and look at this, how do I evaluate whether or not a project is something that I should work on? Okay, here's a few of the things that I would do. So number one, I'm interested to know what language it's written in. So I would go and I would, in over here on the right, I look and I see that this is mostly written in the Go language. And you might say, well, I don't know Go, so this is off the table for me. Or you might say, I really want to learn about Go, so maybe I'll try this. Both of those options are available, so you might eliminate it based on the fact that it, it's uh, written in Go. Or you might say, this is perfect, I want to, um, you know, this is what I really want to do. I'm also interested, when you look at the contributors, mm -hmm. I'm interested to see how active is this project. So you can see here from, from September 2019 to September 2020, you can see this is how long the project's been going. And you can see that the activity has been like really growing. They just released their 1.0 version of the software. And so you can see how many people are working on it. So you can also see in these in the commits how many people are active over time. So you'll see sometimes people pop in and they fix a bug and then they disappear or they get involved for a little while and then they leave. So this is the kind of thing you'll do as well. You know, you'll come and you'll add some code to something and you'll show up, but then you won't be there all the time. So lots of these projects have a few people who work on them, like that's their main job. And then lots and lots of people who are contributing to it. They're not necessarily working on it every day, but they're adding, they're fixing bugs, they're adding documentation and so on. So when you're looking at a project, make sure that the project is still active. If you come and you see a graph and if the graph has stopped like last year and nobody's working on it, it may not be it may not be active anymore. Lots of projects get finished, so there's nothing more to be done or um, projects people move on from them or people take a holiday and they don't work on them. Um, it depends. So figure out whether or not the project is still ongoing. Okay, so what language is it in? Is the project still active? The third thing that I would look at is, are there open issues? So on GitHub, we have, across the top, we have the code, we have the issues, and we have pull requests. So the issues are things that the project wants to have fixed. So either the developers or the users have filed issues and they've said, okay, there is a bug. When I authenticate in Windows, it creates .configs in the user profile directory. So this is, this is a bug. Or here's an enhancement. I'd like to add a dash capital C option. And so we could click on each of these and we could see what's going on. So this represents active discussion. You can see this one was 17 minutes ago, 19 minutes ago, three hours ago, nine hours ago. People are filing issues. They're having discussions. They're commenting on, the, on these things. If I go and take a look at the pull requests, I can see that there's a bunch of pull requests from eight hours ago, 19 hours ago, yesterday, yesterday. And another thing that I would encourage you to do is go and look and see how far back to the pull requests go. Did people send pull requests in 2017 that are still sitting here and they haven't been, they haven't been uh, addressed yet? That might be a sign that this project isn't as active or isn't interested in having people contribute to it. I mean, it doesn't always mean that, but these are some signals that you can get when you're trying to look at this and figure out what's going on. Okay. So this is, so this is the, the CLI project. So if we, let's look at some other ones. Um, here's another one, a minimalist uh, command line knowledge base parser, knowledge base manager rather written in Python. So if I go and look at this repository, what do I see? Well, I scroll down and I see that this is written in mostly in Python. And if I click on contributors, I can see that this is quite a small project. It looks like it's mostly the work of one person, right? You can see that it's it's very new, like it's only, 
It's only happened in the last little while, so it's a very young project. If I go to the issues, there's only three issues that are currently open, so there's not a lot of work to be done on this project. So is this a good project to work on? It's possible, but I would say that there's less opportunity here to work on it than there is to work on something that has more issues or more people or more energy. So there's just less happening here, which doesn't make it bad, but when you're trying to evaluate this, it may or may not be a good thing. What else is in this list? Uh, here's a project from Google. So Google test, let's go have a look at it. This is a project that's mostly written in C++, 299 contributors. We go and take a look at it. How active is the project? So you can see that the project starts out in 2013 and it sort of dies and then it gets picked up again in 2016 and 2017 and then it really starts to pick up again. So there's there's been more activity. And if you take a look here, you can see different people working on it. There are 115 open issues. So there are issues that are in here. Um, you know, is this a good project to work on? I don't know. So we have to evaluate it based on other things that we're going to talk about in a minute. Let's look at a couple more. What else is in here? Uh, Microsoft has a project in here, one fuzz. So we got a project mostly written in Rust and Python, six contributors, very, uh, very new project, right? It's only been around since the summer, or at least it's only been open source since the summer. It's the work of just a, a small number of people. You go to the issues, uh, seven open issues. So even though it's it's a project by Microsoft, it's not a huge project in terms of contribution opportunity. So when you're looking at these things, what I want to what I want to say to you is that even though a project is popular, it may or may not be it may or may not be a perfect project for you to work on. Um, as a new contributor, because there may not be enough uh, surface area for you to get involved. Let's look at one more. So here's the PyTorch project. This is for, um, this is um, a machine learning. PyTorch is a huge project. So what do we got here? Mostly written in C++ and Python, 1500 contributors. So this is a huge project. You can see that from the graph, the project is getting more active over time, not less. So that's good news. Issues. There are over 5,000 issues open on this project. So there's lots and lots and lots of things that need to be done in here. And you say to yourself, is this a good project to get involved in? Again, we have to use some other tests to try and figure it out, but there's certainly lots of things to be done in this project. There's lots of people. It's a big established project. Should you avoid big projects? Are they gonna to be too complicated? Well, it's hard to say. Oftentimes big projects have lots of little bits of work that need to be done and they don't have enough people. So lots of people depend on this. Um, but you can see that this project is also really busy. Like there are currently over 2000 or almost 2000 pull requests open. And how far back do they go? they go all the way back to 2017. So you can see that this project may or may not be good. Sometimes the project is too small. There's not enough going on for you to get involved. And sometimes the project is too big and there's not enough. It's going to be hard to get noticed. So both things can happen in between. So it's not, it's not easy when we're trying to evaluate this, you know, to figure out what we should be working on. So here's another query that I did. Right now on GitHub, there are... 22 million open issues across all of the different um, GitHub repositories. And like that's everything from like Google Cloud Platform to somebody's website to Microsoft, uh, Azure Docs. Like there's just all kinds of things that are open bugs right now that you could get involved in. So I promise you that with 22 million, uh, 22 million of these of these open issues, there's there's four that you can work on, guaranteed. But you have to find, you know, what would be what would be a good thing for you to work on. Okay, so let me give you some ideas of how you could start. Um, the, one of the things you could do is you could search for 
bugs that have a label of Hacktoberfest. So that cuts it down to 28,000, which is a lot. So there's 28,000 projects that have this open and they're all sorts of different projects. Um, help with documentation, help with tests, throw an error if, uh, the, if the size doesn't match, um, add Postman API docs in the readme, lots and lots of different things that you could work on here and all different kinds of projects that um, are, are available. So if we, if we looked at these, I, I, uh, I looked at this earlier and I pulled up a few. Let's take a look at a few of these issues and see what they're like. So here's a, here's a project in the OpenShift project. OpenShift, if you're into um, cloud computing, this is a good, interesting project to work on. And OpenShift, if I just open this up, OpenShift has 513 repositories. There's all kinds of repositories that they're working on, all kinds of people working on this. And this particular one is in the OpenShift docs repository. So what is this issue? All the files listed above have instances of OpenShift versus OpenShift, so the capital letter S. So they need somebody to go through all of these files find all the open shifts and turn them so that they are the correct case. So this would be a perfect way to get started contributing to this project. It's gonna take you through the workflow of uh, updating a bunch of files, working with, you know, forking the repository, cloning the repository, making the updates, creating a branch, pushing it up to GitHub, getting your code reviewed and getting your changes accepted into the project. So when we talk about fixing an issue, fixing an issue doesn't mean you have to write 25,000 lines of C++. You can go and you can you know, correct a, a document typo like this. That would work for sure. Uh, let's try another one. Here's another issue that I found. So arrange the props alphabetically. So this is for React Native. And so the documentation uh, of all the components lists the prop as well as their usage. It would be great if these were done alphabetically. So this is another docs issue. And you can see that not only does this issue have the Hacktoberfest label, but it also has the good first issue label. And you can see that since I was here, so three minutes ago, somebody has already jumped on this issue and said, um, like, I basically, I'd like to do this. This would be a good issue for me to do. So these issues get snapped up pretty quickly. Uh, I pulled up some other ones. So here is another query. So there are 28 open um, Hacktoberfest issues in Microsoft repositories. So maybe you say to yourself, I'd really like to contribute to Microsoft and um, I'm gonna work on one of, these, one of these different projects. So when you think about working, for, working on something with Microsoft, you're not even gonna uh, be aware of all the different repositories and things that they have available. Lots of stuff you'll never have heard of before will be in here. So if you go and you look like, um, here, let's see what this one's like. Whoops. So the parser should allow binary literals and it goes on to describe the changes that it wants. And somebody comes along and says, I don't have any experience with this grammar yet. I'd be glad to give this a try. So what does Microsoft say? Please go ahead. So what I want you to notice is that you can work on things that you haven't done before. You can try things in projects that you've never contributed to before. All of this stuff is going to be okay. Um, and people aren't gonna yell at you when you show up and you know, like this is an example here. Now this was a bug from a couple of years ago that still hasn't been fixed. So actually it looks like somebody, you could still work on this because nobody followed through on it, nobody's fixed it. So one of the, one of the criticisms that I've heard from students is that this Hacktoberfest issue uh, label, what happens is people who wanna do Hacktoberfest are constantly watching this label and they go and they jump on these issues really quickly and it can be hard to um, hard to grab them. So another label you can use is the good 
first issue label. Good first issue, there's 121,000 of these open right now. And they're in, again, all kinds of different, um, all kinds of different projects. And they all want, you know, different things to be done. Good first issue doesn't have a specific meaning. It means this issue would be a good one if you want to get started on this project. But the project might be quite hard, so you might still have to know a lot of things. Or um, the project, the bug might be quite easy, like you need to fix some documentation or, um, you know, it's going to depend. I'm just looking through to see if there's one that would be... Um, good for you to think about. Tons and tons. Um, like Netlify, for example, has one that's open. They want someone to do, make changes or... Lots of these I don't know. Um, like lots of these will be small little projects and you might say, well, I'm not sure if this is a good project for me or not. Like it's open fab lab, tons and tons of these, right? So like part of what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to sort through these and find something that's interesting to you. So um, with these good first issues, you can also add, like for example, if you wanted to look for good first issues, you know, in Facebook repositories. So there are 131 open good first issues inside of Facebook. And you'll notice that when you look at some of these, a lot of people have already commented on them. So like right here, there's two people that have already commented on this. Like if we go and look at it, you'll see, um, you know, I'll try, I'll try and work on this. Like somebody's already said, I'll try this. So sometimes when you're looking at these, it can be helpful to do a sort and you can sort by the least commented which will allow you to find things that don't have other people talking about them. So, you know, um, good first issue on this one, the make file should test the presence of a directory. So if I go here, you'll see that, oh shoot. Um, there's, a, there's a bug, but nobody has uh, signed up for this. So it's a relatively new bug, July 27th from uh, the label was added 10 days ago, and you can see that there's nobody here who's doing this. So maybe that would be a good bug for you. You could go and have a look at it. Or let's say you wanted to, let's say um, you have a goal of, you know, someday you wanna try and get a job at Shopify. You could go right now and start working on open source projects that are owned by Shopify. Imagine if your resume has on it that you've already contributed code into one of their projects. They're going to notice that. So here there's lots of different ones. Good first issue, good first issue, good first issue. They have different things that they uh, want people to work on. So you could take a look through these. And again, you can sort it by least commented or you could sort it by the oldest. So like this is the oldest from 2018 or by the newest. And you know, here's one from March 14th that already has a bunch of people on it. And you can see that there's already a pull request attached to it. So that might not be a good one, but this one here could be a good one because there's nobody who has done, done any of that work. So I would say to you that um, when you're looking at these projects, you're going to find that some pro just because a project is on GitHub doesn't mean it's a good project for you. The project might be dead. There's nobody working on it. The lights are out. So there's no contributions anymore um, or they've just stopped. Um, some projects you're going to find they're open, like they're on GitHub, but you can't contribute to them on GitHub. So the company works on them and then they shove it out the door and put it on GitHub and that's it. So you're going to want to look for community based open source projects where they are taking pull requests from people and you can get involved and they're interested in mentoring, you know, mentoring you so you can work on things. What kinds of things can you work on? Well, you can fix bugs in in various uh, pieces of code. So a lot of times, um, like if I was looking at some of these things and it says feature, I would be I would be interested. Let me do another query here. Let me go back. I'm going to look for good first issue, and I'm also going to look for another label. 
bug. So there's 11,000 open good first issues that are also labeled with bug. Oftentimes a bug is a good place to start because a bug means that the code is supposed to do this, the code is doing this. So it's, it's probably possible for you to fix the code without having to write a lot of new code. Whereas if I was looking for a new feature, so there's 2000 um, open good first issues where they want you to um, write a new feature. Feature work tends to be bigger. It tends to be that you're gonna have to write a lot of new code and writing a lot of new code in a project can be hard. So I would say that this might not be where you wanna start. Remember, start small and work your way up. You can get to feature work, but you don't necessarily want to uh, start with feature work when you're, when you're just you know, beginning. So another thing you could do is you could work on docs. So again, you could I could do a search and I could say good first issue in docs. So 688 of them come out and lots of cool things come up. Uh, Twitch comes up, PyTorch comes up, uh, Dino comes up. If you've, if you've ever heard of Dino, uh, which is an interesting uh, take on like similar ideas to um, uh, Node.js, Pandas comes up, all kinds of things. Red Hat, lots and lots of things, Material UI, lots of places that you could get involved doing documentation. And a documentation fix can be quite small. Maybe you're fixing typos like we saw a minute ago. Maybe you're adding more documentation. Another thing that you might get involved in is you might get involved in doing translations. So if you are someone who speaks more than one language, you might get involved in doing docs. Let me show you an example of a really cool project. So um, a bunch of uh, Seneca students took on translating all of the React documentation into Ukrainian. And so they worked as a team to have people come and uh, you know, contribute all of these different translations, which is, a, which is amazing to think that you know, if people are reading the React documentation in, um, they're in Ukrainian, they're, they're reading the work of Seneca students. So you don't have to translate all of React, but you could get involved in helping these projects um, translate some of their documentation over to a language that you speak. Maybe you speak uh, another language other than English and you wanna get involved and help, help doing something like that. You could get involved in working on CSS. Um, so, some, sometimes this stuff is hard, but like if I wanted to look for a good first issue that included CSS, I can find um, 2000 open issues that include some amount of, of CSS. And so you might be able to come in here and get involved in a project, helping them improve their CSS. So who knows? Uh, you could do some design work. There's lots and lots of different things that you could do. Another project that you could work on that I just wanted to call out, and that is the our telescope project. So this project has 77 open issues, and you are welcome to work on any of these issues if you want to as well. And we can help you. There's, um, you know, our myself and other students maintain this. Later in the term, I'll get more of you involved in this, but you might want to get involved in doing this right now. And there are students in the class, like Mo, I think already has a pull request up right now, working on fixing a bug. And you know, like the fix can be quite small. So like this, this change here, it is not necessarily gonna be a huge code change, but the impact of the change is gonna be significant. So don't feel like you have to uh, boil the ocean in order to have an effect. You can make lots and lots of progress on big projects or small projects through small, uh, small, small uh, changes like this. So when you're gonna start working on a project, we talked about looking at what language is it written in, looking at the contributors, looking for the open issues and so on. Another thing you wanna look at is you wanna look at the readme. And the readme is gonna have information often for users, but also for people who want to contribute to a project. So for example, on this readme, you can see, how do I get involved? It says, for contribution information, see our contributors documentation and come talk to us on Slack. So I wanted to talk about both of these things. So a lot of, uh, a lot of projects will have one of these files, contributing.md, and it is a file that's usually meant for developers, people who want to contribute to the project, and it'll tell you how do you 
install it? How do you run the tests? What are the coding standards? How do you submit a, um, a bug fix? What are, the, what are the best practices for this project? How does everything work? So you're definitely gonna wanna read through the documentation for the projects that you work on. Another thing you're gonna wanna watch for is something like this. Lots of projects have their own communication channels. Maybe they use Discord or Matrix or Slack or something else or Gitter. And you can go and talk to the developers online just like we do in our Slack channel. So if they have some kind of a community uh, channel that you can go and join, I would highly recommend that you get involved and join the channel and you know talk to the developers, ask them questions when you get stuck. So another thing that people often ask me is, am I allowed to fix an issue in a project if it's not listed in the issues? And the answer to that is yes. Like if you find a bug in a project and you want to um, try and work on that project, you could um, file your own issue and try and um, try and fix it. So I would say to you that it's probably easier when you're beginning to fix an issue that's already been filed on the project. However, if you want to try and um, if you if you notice a bug in a piece of software that you use and you want to fix it, you could do that. So the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to get involved in projects that you use. So like for example. Um, a lot of you are using VS Code, and I've had many students contribute to Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code currently has 5,296 open issues. And there's just all kinds of issues in here. And, um, you know, if I was going to try and solve this, I might look for label bug. Or I got to spell label correctly. Hmm. What did I do wrong? If I click on bug, there we go. So they have a thousand open issues that have bug on them. My guess is that they probably don't have any good first issues. Let's see if I'm wrong. Good first issue. I'm wrong. So there are 13 open issues that are labeled good first issue. And you can see that this is a pretty competitive project. So there's lots of comments on here already and lots of pull requests on here. So you may or may not be able to, you know, jump into this and, and get involved. But another thing I was going to mention to you, I talked about, you know, um, if you're working on a project like VS Code or Telescope that we were just talking about. So the Telescope project, we use lots and lots of dependencies in these projects. So the Telescope project uses all kinds of dependencies and so do many, um, many projects. If you go and you look at the node modules directory in a JavaScript project, these are all open source projects, every single one of these that you could contribute to. So you might think about, I wanna contribute to uh, React. Um, you know, I wanna, I wanna contribute to React. Well, if you go to the React site, um, Actually, where is React? React has its own React. That is not it. Uh, here it is, React. If I go to the main, um, I guess this is maybe just the translation. This is the React community, reactjs.org. Give me one second, GitHub React. Facebook React, I was right the first time. Okay, so if I came to React and I go looking here, are there any good first issues? Good first issue, uh, yeah, right now there's three. But you can see that there, again, there's 23, 32 comments on here. So again, there may or may not be um, opportunities for you to get involved in that regard. But you might be able to get involved in, um, one of the dependencies that it uses. So like they use lots and lots of um, other projects, like other dependencies, and each of these ones uses other dependencies, and you might be able to get involved in one of those projects. So getting involved in an open source project often can mean getting involved in the ecosystem of projects 
that are available. So I'm going to pause this discussion here now because I just wanted to get you thinking. I wanted to get you thinking about how you're going to get started with Hacktoberfest. And I'm going to give you some links uh, as you get going this week so you can start looking for projects to work on. I would suggest to you, imagine at the end of this course, what do you want to be able to put on your resume that isn't there today? What kind of experience, what kind of projects do you want to be able to say, I have done this, and what do you need to do now in order to get there? So if your goal is to contribute to machine learning, you know, you say to yourself, I really want to get involved in something like, um, I want to get involved in TensorFlow. So you go to the main TensorFlow and there's like 3,800 issues that are open and you're like, can I actually get involved in this? Is it possible? It may not be possible for you to start here. Let's have a look. Five open issues. Um, it may not be the best first thing that you do, but you can work up to this. You'd be amazed at how quickly you can go from not knowing how to use GitHub to you know, solving each of these steps and getting yourself into the right position. So what I'd like to do, I've got one more video I wanna do with you this week, and that is I'm going to go through the entire process. I'm gonna fix a bug in a project that I've never worked on before. So I'll do it with you live and I'll show you exactly what I would do in order to figure this out and how I would communicate, how I would solve the bug, send it up to GitHub, get feedback, etc. So that's what we'll do in the next video and it will help give you a sense of what's involved when you are gonna try and go and do this for yourself, which you're gonna be doing for all of October.